Um, so I am at Stanford. I'm in the Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. So it's a bit of a choose your own adventure PhD program because I am not affiliated with any department. Uh, we're not affiliated with any particular faculty. So we get to choose our advisors from wherever we want and we get to work on whatever we can convince our advisors is worthwhile to work on. So as an example of how interdisciplinary our program is, my committee is made up of an engineer, a coastal policy lawyer, an earth scientist, and an English professor. And today I'm gonna to talk about the work that I do with the English professor, uh, because what we do is, actually in the, um, in the slide that Greg showed where he had the risks on one side and the counterbalances on the other side, the adaptive capacity, what I'm trying to do is find a better way to analyze that side of the equation, a better way to understand what are the factors that make our governance systems in particular be able to adapt. And so the reason I think about this is because it goes back to what you were saying, sir, about non-stationarity, that the problem of climate change is not one where we can look to the past in order to predict the future. When we see variability in the environment, we can respond and we can adapt when we see disasters, like too much water or too little. But we're going to have to adapt, and then climate will continue to change, and we'll have to adapt again, and then climate will continue to change, and we have to adapt again, and so on and so forth. So as a lawyer, what I'm really interested in is when we write laws, we write a law and we assume that the law will be the law forever. So the way that we measure the sea level is a 19-year average, and that was decided by the Supreme Court in the 1900s. The same Supreme Court that decided that Major League Baseball is not a business. But they decided that in the 1900s, and because they decided it, that is now the truth forever and always, no matter whether or not the reality changes. And so one of the interesting things is in any situation where the science is going to change, how do we write laws and create government systems that can respond and be flexible in a similar way? And we can use any of these words to talk about it. Um, a lot of these terms mean the same thing or different things. And I'd love to have the semantic discussion over what exactly all of these terms mean. You've probably seen them all in different contexts. But the one I'm really interested in is this concept. It's how do we respond flexibly to changing conditions, to take advantage of opportunities or mitigate risks without losing the ability to respond to further change in the future? So how do we avoid lock-in? How do we avoid the moral hazard of building up the levee so that more people live next to the coast, so that more people are exposed to the risk? How do we prevent that? And so for that, I'm really looking at this concept of adaptive capacity. So my question for my dissertation is essentially, how do we build the adaptive capacity of governance systems to respond to uncertain risks like climate change? And this, in some ways, is really just about changing the way that we think. So I could approach this by doing a sort of field experiment, going out to a place and looking at the adaptive capacity. But frankly, that's been done, and it's been done hundreds of times, because the idea of adaptive capacity is not new. It actually arose in the 1940s when it was businesses looking at how they could respond to changing technological and new markets. How could they become like Google and take over every new market as it emerged and respond flexibly? So this just goes through, and I plotted every single paper that's ever been published on adaptive capacity. Um, and so you can see the trend. And the trend that I think is particularly interesting is uh, where's my marker? There. You see this huge jump here at the end in the number of papers that have been published on adaptive capacity coincides with the publication of the 2001 third assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change when they first used the term adaptive capacity. So they didn't coin the term, but when they made it popular, then suddenly everyone starts talking about adaptive capacity. And everyone started talking about adaptive capacity without defining it. The official definition in the IPCC of the adaptive capacity is the capacity to adapt. I have problems with that. Um, so, as a starting point, one of the papers I hope to write for my dissertation eventually will be what the heck is adaptive capacity? What is the actual definition? And one way that I'm trying to get at that, to understand what is the definition and what are the factors that go into adaptive capacity, is I'm simply doing a meta-analysis. So I take all the papers that are, have ever been published on adaptive capacity, and I look, I categorize them, are they, uh, linguistics or an engineering paper. There's a lot of papers out there on the adaptive capacity of your spine or the adaptive capacity of um, genetic diversity in fish species, right? So I eliminate those. And I look only at the adaptive capacity of social systems. So a community, a nation, an individual, those papers. I take all of those papers and I'm actually using methods from the digital humanities, so text mining, sentiment analysis, collocation analysis is what I'll talk about today. But first what I do is I go through all of these papers and I try and figure out what are all of the factors. What's that long list, right? And Greg's like sidebar where he's got all that data that goes into the noise. 
And when you look at all of these different papers, you actually come up with 106, and that's an early number, so we're actually still getting more than that, right? So you get more than 100 factors. And these are the kinds of things that people come up with. Access to technology, authority, autonomy, awareness of options, education, governance, flexibility. And what's interesting is that no one paper ever analyzes all of these factors. The maximum number of factors any one paper ever looks at is 42. The minimum is two. So somewhere between there and how those are chosen is what you feel like. What are you interested in? Would you like to write a paper on this set of five or that set of five or these 10 or that 10 or some subset? So this obviously makes it very difficult to compare these papers and to draw them together and to bring lessons learned out of it. And that's one of the reasons I find that text analysis is very interesting, is it allows me to go into these articles and actually use the computer to detect patterns in the articles, in how the authors are talking about these terms, that the authors themselves may not be aware of. Because you're looking at a meta pattern that's coming out of any one given paper, it's sort of the implicit underlying assumptions that are being stated. And one thing that I'm really interested in is how do these relate to one another? So great, you have a list of 106 items. But to be honest, if I go to the local government and I say, to improve your adaptive capacity, you should improve 106 things. They'll say I'm crazy, right? If I take that to USAID and I say, here's your 106 items that you need to increase in every single community you go to, that doesn't work. So I start to get really interested in how, why, why is trust of government so important? Why is education so important? And education in particular, I like as an example because there could be many reasons why education matters. Education could matter because it increases your awareness of climate change. So maybe I should go into schools as an intervention and I should improve the education curriculum around climate change. Maybe it matters because if you have more engineers who can come up with more technical solutions, they have more adaptive capacity. So maybe I should push people into STEM fields. Maybe it matters because it's a marker of socioeconomic status. And all of these different things, the role that education plays would have a different implication for how I intervene as a policymaker or how I intervene as a development authority. So I analyze this, I do a collocation analysis. And this is very simply, it looks at different words and it tells me how close together they are. <laughs> so I take the word, for example, uh, we're all getting challenges with this. Yeah, okay, I take the word education. And the computer program simply looks 10 words behind, 10 words forward, about the average length of a sentence. 17 words is the average length of a sentence in the English language. I now know that, if you need that for trivia. And, uh, and it looks, and it finds that, say, the words wealth and people are statistically frequent to show up next to education, statistically more likely to show up next to education than any other word on my list of 106. But then I notice that people really isn't that significant because people shows up so often in the entire literature. So that wealth is really the important one. And here's what I get. I find that the five words most often associated with education are occupation, wealth, income, awareness, and knowledge. When you start going back then, you can look and you can pull out the sections of text and start looking at this. What this tells me is that education in the literature to date is not playing a role of building awareness and knowledge or that role is much more minimal than its role as a socioeconomic marker of wealth, occupation, and income. On the order of a magnitude of 10, look at this, this final column on the right is the observed correlations versus the expected, given the frequency of these words in the texts. That's an order of 10 magnitude difference between occupation and knowledge. So the association between education and occupation is very, very strong, whereas its association with increasing knowledge is actually rather weak in the literature. Now, is that a true state of affairs in the world? I don't know. But that's the underlying assumption that the literature is promoting in the way that we're talking about it, in the way that we're going about this. And so this, I think, raises interesting questions about how we intervene with education. Or should education be on our list of factors that should be intervened in? Furthermore, I can use this uh, collocation analysis to create a network. <clears throat> so this is a very messy network. Uh, which I just use Gephi open source software to create this network. And then I uh, give it a size, so each node has a size, which is its betweenness measure. So the betweenness measure is sort of its centrality to the network, how important is each node in the network. And also it detects on its own, it detects communities. So it does a community detection algorithm where it creates these different groups. And again, you can see that education, for example, shows up here next to school, occupation, literacy, health, right, and not, <laughs> 
interestingly, next to knowledge or information or some of the other factors where we think it, thought it might be. So I'm still playing around with this because I need to, I'm working on the, call, on the uh, modularity analysis, the grouping. Um, but there's some interesting results there. The grouping is very strong. You can run this 100 times and you get the same group about 98 times out of it. Um, so the grouping analysis is very strong in terms of how these words are tied together in their groups. Uh, and I'm still doing the analysis on, on how that works. But what it starts to indicate, and the way this is different, is um, it starts to indicate a new framework. So that rather than giving people 106 determinants that they need to focus on, or even rather than giving them some list that I come up with. The IPCC has a list of six, um, including you need technology, you need resources, you need education. Um, I'm saying technology and education and resources aren't actually important. What's important is the role that they play. And so the role that education plays might be to raise awareness. The role that education plays might be to create motivation. The role that education plays might be as an access to resources through greater occupation and income. But education is not important. What's important is what it gives you, what the function is that it has. And so this is where I want to, um, the grand ambition for my dissertation is to try and shift the discussion from identifying the list of factors to starting to talk about the mechanism of how those factors work and why they matter. Because I think once we start shifting that discussion to the how and the why, that's where we'll be able to have more effective interventions and more effective discussion and communication. So this is, uh, again, everything I'm gonna tell you today is a work in progress because I'm still in the middle of my PhD. But you need to have some adaptation options that exist. It can be very much constrained by your geographic conditions, such as uh, in Florida, building seawalls is not an option because of the geology, because of the limestone and the ability to build those. In other places, that is. Uh, so there's some constraint just on your geographics and your demographics. You have to be aware of both your risks and your options as a decision maker. Uh, if there's an option, but I've never heard of it, then that doesn't really help me. Uh, if I'm not motivated, and this can be both my motivation, but also my constituents. So if I'm a mayor who really wants to relocate homes away from the flood zone, that's nice, but it probably won't happen. So that's not as important as motivating my constituency. And again, there are gonna be multiple ways to get this. So when we start mapping those 106 determinants onto this kind of framework, you can see that many of the determinants will fall into each of these categories. So for example, to become aware of my options, I might become aware of my options through education. I might become aware of my options through a social network. I might become aware of my options through my experience. By having been in an earthquake 10 times, I now know what works or what doesn't work. And what matters is not that I have to have all of them, it's that I have to have something to check off each of these functional categories. This raises a very different way of approaching this. So um, the way this is often addressed in literature is that you aggregate them, so you have you say, we need some authority, you need some financial resources, and you need a social network. And the aggregate theory says you need all of them, and we're just gonna count up how much you have in each. Uh, my favorite way of measuring this is we're going to assign everything a score of red, yellow, or green, and then we'll aggregate them. Not surprisingly, most countries come out as having an adaptive capacity of yellow, which is really helpful to the decision maker. Um, and what's interesting is that under the aggregate theory, it doesn't matter where you put your additional resources because it's an aggregate score. I can throw in my additional resources anywhere and mathematically, my aggregate score will be the same. Alternatively, they talk about a weakest link theory. So whatever my weakest point is out of that list of 106, I need to figure out which one is red and elevate it to yellow and put it there. But when you actually start looking at the research, it suggests a totally different way of approaching this, which is to say that instead, what matters is having a pathway, is having some element of getting you over that threshold. And here there's actually uh, great studies from Africa looking at drought and pastoral communities where they need access to additional pasture for their cattle. And some do it by having a lot of money and purchasing additional pasture, and some do it by having strong social networks and using their friends to get to additional pasture. The problem is that those two studies are different studies that never cited each other and are never cited in the same paper. <laughs> So no one's noticed that both of those are options. Um, but so the literature shows that you don't have to have both necessarily. And in fact, it may be better to have one really strong, to have a lot of money, or to have a lot of social connections but no money, rather than to have mediocre in both. Because you're gonna have to compete with people who have strong social networks and no money, or people who have strong financial resources but no social network. 
So rather than putting limited amount of resources into everything and getting an aggregate that's sort of low, it might actually make more sense to have strong in some areas and weak in other areas. And this is a very different way of approaching how we build our capacity in these kinds of systems. But this also raises research questions, right? What is the threshold? How are the trade-offs? How much financial resource for how much social connection? And those kinds of questions will have to be answered in actual field research, but, but by getting at this approach, I can at least start to ask those questions, questions that we haven't been asking about these things to date. So, yeah, it shows some new research directions, which I think is interesting. For example, is formal education really more important as a socioeconomic marker than as a knowledge raiser? Um, you know, the, that's the way the literature is discussing it to date, but is that really the way it is in the world, or is that a, an assumption that came through unfortunate wording in the way we write up our results? How do we evaluate trade-offs? We're not going to get all 106 determinants, and from my analysis, I don't think we need to. I think that's not necessary. But which ones are the most important? Which ones are the critical nodes? Which ones are the trade-offs, and how do we measure the trade-off among them? And then this approach also suggests um, a better assessment mechanism, because rather than saying, has adaptive capacity increased, which is a very difficult question to answer because we don't have a metric for adaptive capacity, instead we can ask, does education correlate with risk awareness or not? Does education actually play this role or that role to be able to ask those kinds of questions instead? Um, I'm applying this through a series of field studies um, around the world. As I mentioned in the UK, because I love the rugby, and in Philippines because the scuba diving is incredible, and in the Arctic because I'm from Minnesota and I love the cold, um, and because the Navy does a lot of work up there. So um, hopefully through these applications, I'll be able to see how well this framework works when it's applied, trying to get decision makers. Um, but so far I have found that being able to show them a much more simplified framework that has just functional categories, showing them this, is a lot easier to understand and to start asking them, where's your weak point in this framework, is much simpler for a decision maker than to start asking them, rank this list of 50 categories on a one scale of one to five. And instead of being able to say, your adaptive capacity is six, and they say out of how many, or your adaptive capacity is yellow, I can tell them, your weak point in your adaptive capacity framework is that you have low motivation amongst your constituents. That's a problem that we can start to work on. That's something that's more tractable than saying, you're a yellow. Um, so yeah, next steps are uh, getting my PhD. Uh, at least that's the plan. So um, happy to talk more about the coding or the network analysis or next steps. But for now, that's my presentation. Thanks. So do you understand why these two young ladies are <laughs> the first two scholars? Yes, sir. So, so one of the things I just completed actually is, uh, it, <laughs> unfortunately I have to go through by hand at the moment and tag everything. <laughs> so I just went through and coded a lot of um, these papers and so I'm starting to look at them in time series, in chunks um, of decadal right now. So looking at the different decades and how they respond. Um, the biggest pattern that's changed though is the topic shift, right? Uh, we don't talk about adaptive capacity to climate change until well into the 2000s. Uh, everything before that was either general adaptive capacity or particularly in the workforce. There's a lot of economics work being done on adaptive capacity in the workplace, um, which the lessons are still very comparable, even though the subject matter is different. Yeah. Interestingly, the first use of the word adaptive, uh, ad adaptation in relationship to a bill that was put out by Congress is the Everglades Restoration Act. It was the very first one because Congress does not fund things that you don't know what's going to come out at the other end. And um, so adapt that was a big step for the feds to literally put the word adaptive uh, management in, into the, the SERP Act. 
Okay. Uh, Kirk and uh, and um, 